everyone. In today's lecture, we are going to look at control of infection. In this lecture, we will outline the measures of the control of infection, define the terms transmission-based precaution and types of isolation nursing. Infection control, the main objective is to stop the spread of infections, especially in healthcare settings. As such, we will be discussing two types of isolation nursing. Source isolation, or also known as barrier nursing and the second one will be protective isolation or also known as reverse barrier nursing. We will look at the purpose and principles of transmission based precaution and we will discuss a disinfection briefly. How to control infection in healthcare settings? In healthcare settings, Health infection control practices are critical. They are very important to reduce the transmission of infections from one person to another. It could be from a healthcare worker to a patient or visitor from a visitor to a patient or vice versa from a patient to a healthcare worker. So we can isolate the person to control infection. Rationale for isolation precaution. If you remember the chain of infection that we discussed in lecture 3, you know that the reservoir or the source of infection, it can be infected humans. For example, patients or any healthcare worker, any admin staff in the hospital, okay, any technical staff in the hospital, or it could be visitors, relatives who are or friends coming to visit the patients. They could be bringing in diseases into the hospital. And these can then be transmitted to the host. The host could be patients. It could also be healthcare workers or even visitors. If it is going, if it is from patients to visitors, then the visitors will be the host. There are two tier when we talk about isolation precaution. Standard precaution, we discussed this in the last lecture, standard precaution. And then today we are going to look at transmission based precaution. Transmission based precaution is a set of second tier precautions. So this is for care of patients known or suspected to be infected with epidemiologically or highly transmissible pathogens. In other words, these precautions are to be taken as a result of diagnosis of a specific pathogen. Now, if you remember last week when we discussed standard precautions, you would have understood that standard precautions apply to all patients before the diagnosis of their illness. When a patient comes to a hospital or to a clinic or any healthcare setting, you take standard precautions because you, are, you do not know what kind of infections the patient is carrying. Now, after seeing the doctor, after the patient has been diagnosed with a specific pathogen, for example, now after diagnosis, you know that the patient has chicken pox. Then you take transmission-based precaution. There are three types of transmission-based precautions. Contact precaution, droplet precaution, and airborne precaution. So if the patient has chicken pox, okay, you have to take contact precaution or airborne precautions. So as I mentioned, these are the three types of transmission-based precaution. Contact, droplet. Droplet, as you know, involves direct droplets or aerosols and then we have the airborne drop, uh, airborne precaution involving droplet nuclei and this can be indirect mode of transmission first we will look at contact precaution so contact precaution as you know it is transmitted the disease is transmitted 
by direct or indirect contact with patient or contaminated items, formites. So this is to prevent transmission of organisms that can be transmitted through formites or through direct contact with the patient. Now examples of diseases that can be transmitted through direct contact or formites include MRSA, methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus, certain skin infection such as scabies, diphtheria, or enteric infections, or enteric gut infections, rotavirus, hepatitis A, and as I mentioned earlier, chickenpox. Scabies can be transmitted through direct contact with patients. Scabies is an infestation. Infestation means there are tiny mites living on the outer layers of the human skin. And the mites, what do they do? They burrow and lay eggs inside the skin. And this leads to itching and rashes. But it is not caused by a microorganism. It's caused by a mite. But it is highly transmissible. It can be transmitted very easily from patient to healthcare worker or visitor to health healthcare worker. Sorry, visitor to patient and so on. Varicella, varicella zoster virus infection. This virus causes two types of infections. Chickenpox and shingles. Here we will look at chickenpox. So chickenpox, as you know, okay, it can happen in the very young children, as a, as a young as even a one a less than a year old, and can also happen in adults. So what do you do when you encounter patients who have uh, infections that are transmissible through direct contact? So contact precaution, you can either place the patient in a one-bedded room if available, which means you isolate the patient in a one-bedded room so that he does not infect other patients. If not, if you don't have a one-bedded room, you can cohort patients infected with the same organism. That means if let's say we are talking about uh, cases of chickenpox, we can group all the chickenpox patients and uh, place them in one in in a in a single room or a single ward. If all above are not available, if let's say you can't find a one bedded room, or there is no way for you to cohort patients who are infected with the same microorganism. What you can do is that you can maintain a spatial separation, spatial separation of at least three feet or one meter between the infected patient and other patients. This will also, this will reduce the chances of transmission. Second, you need to take precautions, wear gloves, wear aprons and do proper effective hand washing. And visitors must speak with nurses before entering the room. The nurses can advise the, the visitors on the type of precautions to take. Environmental control is also important. Any patient care items, bedside equipment like the cardiac table okay, or any uh, drawers that are frequently touched must be cleaned daily or must be disinfected daily. Patient care equipment. We are talking about contact precautions. So avoid sharing of patient care equipment as much as possible. If you can't avoid sharing of patient care equipment due to lack of resources or lack of uh, um, what do you call that equipments, then clean and disinfect them before using them for another patient. So because we want to reduce the transmission of infections from patient to another patient. Droplet precaution. These precautions are designed for patients who are known or suspected to be infected with microorganisms 
that can be transmitted by respiratory droplets. For example, through coughing, sneezing or even talking. So these droplets generally travel only short distance, 3 feet or less through the air. Now examples of diseases that can be spread through droplets include rubella, meningitis and tuberculosis. So when encountering patients who have uh, infections that can be transmitted by respiratory droplets, it is wise to place the patient in one bedded room if available. So you can see a one bedded room here in this picture. If not, cohort patients infected with the same organisms, which means group the patients. For example, patients who have tuberculosis can be placed in one ward or in one room. If both are not available, not possible, then you maintain a spatial separation. Huh? You separate them separate the patients are, uh, let's say a TB patient here, a TB patient is placed here, okay, another patient who who's does not have TB can be in this bed and there's a distance of about three feet or one meter between them, okay, and as you know, droplets usually travel through air in less than one minute distance. Healthcare workers, you will need to wear a face mask because we are talking about respiratory droplets. So the portal of entry will be through the respiratory system. So we need to wear a mask, do proper hand washing and wear gloves if necessary. Again, visitors must speak with nurses before entering the room. Patient transport. If you need to move the patient from the room to another room. For example, let's say the patient needs to go for an MRI scan or for an X-ray. Okay, the patient needs to be moved from the room to the um, other room where you can do the procedures. So, movement and transport of the patient is only when necessary. And when you are transporting the patient, please ask the patient to wear surgical mask so that when he or she coughs or sneezes, it does not spread to the uh, patients or uh, any visitors or staff along the way. Airborne precautions. These precautions are designed for patients who are infected with pathogens or microorganisms transmitted by the airborne route. Okay, diseases that uh, can be transmitted through airborne include measles, influenza, pneumonia, aspergillus, this is a fungal, this is a fungi, fungal disease, legionella, a bacterial disease, and again we see the chickenpox. So these organisms can be spread via airborne droplet nuclei. They are very tiny in size, airborne droplet nuclei, less than 5 micron in size. So these small light bacteria and viruses found in the or contained in the droplet nuclei or dust particles stay in the air for long periods and they can be distributed or carried away by air current. So as you can see, these are these photos are showing you aspergillus fungi and they can infect the lungs. Legionella. Okay, another bacteria that can be easily transmitted through the air. For patients who have infections that can be transmitted through airborne droplet nuclei, we place them in a negative air pressure isolation room and we keep the door room closed at all times. Now, if the if such a room is not available due to limited engineering resources, okay, we can use a one-bedded non-air conditioned room with open windows and no fan may be used. Here in this picture, you see a room with a negative air pressure. 
as for healthcare workers, you need to wear a feet tested N95 or higher level respirator for to prevent the risk of getting infected. Patient transport. Just as in the case of a droplet precautions, movement of patient or transport of patient is only when necessary. Patients should wear surgical masks during transportation. And if the patient coughs or sneezes, you should give them a tissue or tissue paper to cover his nose or mouth. So to prevent transmission of disease, healthcare professionals must follow isolation practice strictly. Because visitors who come in, who are coming to visit their relatives or friends in hospital, they may not be aware of transmission-based precautions. So usually we will put up an isolation notice in front of the in the room, I mean on the door of the room, okay, to inform visitors to check with healthcare staff before entering. And we will also remind them to wash their hands before leaving the room. So what is the purpose of isolation? Isolation reduces the risk of transmission of microorganisms from an infected person to a healthy person or susceptible host. There are two types of isolation nursing. One is the source isolation, or we call it the barrier nursing. This is used when a patient with an infectious condition is isolated from the rest of the uh, crowd. For example, let's say if someone has TB, you isolate the person who has TB, tuberculosis, okay, from the rest of the people in the clinic or hospital so as to prevent the spread of infection. So here we are isolating the individual, the patient who is the source of infection. Okay, we are not isolating the everyone from this patient, we are isolating the patient who has a transmissible disease okay, from the rest of the patient. Examples can be hand, foot, mouth disease. So when someone has a HFMD, so you isolate the patient, the infected patient from the rest of the crowd. This is called source isolation. You are isolating the source of infection. Next, we have protective isolation or reverse barrier nursing. This is used to protect a patient against opportunistic infection. Okay, especially when there is an immune defect or lowered resistance to infection. For example, let's say a patient there just uh, came out from surgery for bone marrow transplant. So now, so in uh, in the case of transplant, the patient will be given drugs to suppress his or her immune system. So the patient's immune system is not optimal, it's not working at its peak because of the immunosuppressive drugs. So now we need to isolate this patient from other sources of infection. So here what we do, we isolate the vulnerable individual, the patient who is at risk, or you can say that susceptible host from sources of infection. So this is protective isolation. So you're protecting the patient who is at high risk of getting infected from the sources of infection. So the purpose of transmission-based precautions. Now, these precautions are used to prevent the spread of pathogenic and potentially pathogenic microorganisms. So that is the purpose, huh? to prevent the Spread of infections. Now, these precautions include wearing of protective gowns, masks, and correct disposal of contaminated items and treatment of wounds. Nurses need to ensure that they wash their hands effectively before entering the room after contact with patient or 
contaminated articles or contaminated items and also before leaving the room. They should also put on protective clothing, okay, their personal protective equipment okay, before entering the room. And uh, if you are aware, if you are in the room, if you are touching anything that might be potentially contaminated or you are coming into contact with patients, you should avoid touching your hair, nose, mouth, eyes okay, while caring for patients in isolation. Use disposable items if possible. Okay, if you are going to use uh, reusable items, keep them in the room or just outside the room. Do not share it with patients who are in the other rooms or in the other wards. And before you uh, share these the reusable items from one patient to another patient, please decontaminate and reprocess and practice concurrent disinfection. Uh, we will talk about concurrent disinfection in a short while. So as you can see, separate equipments are used for patients on isolation. So this trolley contains uh, equipments used for patients on isolation and is just outside the room. So two types of disinfection, concurrent disinfection and terminal disinfection. So concurrent disinfection is an immediate process which means if you see any contaminated items or articles for example bed linen that is a patient patient has been using is contaminated with blood or vomitus or urine you, you, you immediately disinfect these items so it's immediate disinfection after use as for terminal disinfection this is the um, Disinfection that is carried out at a convenient time. For example, after the patient has been transferred to another ward or the patient has uh, been uh, uh, cured and uh, discharged from the hospital or the patient has died. Okay, So terminal disinfection is what they do at the end when the patient has already been, is no longer the source of infection. Methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus, or commonly known as MRSA. So this is a type of Staphylococcus aureus bacteria, and it is resistant to a lot of antibiotics. So like other Staphylococcus aureus, MRSA can colonize the skin and body of an individual without causing any sickness. So that means people who have MRSA and are not showing any uh, signs and symptoms of disease are carriers. Now MRSA can be spread okay, through nasal secretions, skin contact, any wound, and also through the sputum. Mostly, MRSA spreads through direct contact. Now, who are the susceptible hosts? Who gets MRSA or who is at high risk for MRSA? Patients with low immunity, the immune system is weak, or patients with open wounds or sores. As you know, MRSA is Staphylococcus aureus that likes to colonize the skin. So any open wounds or sores, uh, good, um, what do you call that, um, ground for MRSA to grow. Urinary catheters, those who are um, being treated for urinary tract infections. And MRSA can also cause blood infections, especially uh, with the patients who have drip lines going to veins. So, um, in short, patients who are ill, okay, they develop MRSA infections easily. So, what do we do when you have patients who 
might be infected or infected with MRSA. We can isolate them in a single room and we can also cohort them with other patients who have MRSA and the bed linen and clothing used by patients who have MRSA must be carefully handled. Okay, always keep in mind this MRSA is spread through direct contact. So you need to take precautions such as wearing gloves and gowns. How about healthcare workers who are colonized by MRSA? Now, eradication treatment for MRSA infect infected. So how do we treat infection, MRSA infections? You can have topical application of an antibiotic ointment such as mofi mofirosin or fusidine to the nostrils two to three times per day for three to five days. Those who are infected can shower with antibacterial soap for three to five days. And they can also be given vancomycin through IV. Now vancomycin is probably the last antibiotic um, that can effectively cure MRSA infections. To control the spread of MRSA, we first need to take standard precautions because when a patient comes into the hospital or clinic, you do not know if the patient has MRSA. So you take standard precautions. Then after diagnosis of MRSA, then we take transmission-based precautions. That would be your contact precautions. And then you follow isolation technique. So now let's say if your patient has got MRSA, what type of isolation technique would you use? Source isolation or protective isolation? Okay, correct. Huh? You will be taking source isolation. You will isolate the source of infection. That means patients who have MRSA will be isolated from the rest of the patients or rest of the crowd. Okay, so in this lecture, we have been talking about negative air pressure rooms when we talked about airborne precautions, right? So let's look at positive air pressure and negative air pressure. What is the difference? <clears throat> so positive air pressure means the clean room. Rooms are pumped up with more filtered air than the surrounding space, which means the air that comes into the room is clean. Okay, the air that is pumped into the room is clean. It's the right. So hospitals have positive pressure rooms for patients with compromised immune system. So you want to protect patients who have a, what is it, a weak immune system. Okay, compromised, huh? weak immune system. So you use rooms that have positive air pressure, which means air will flow out of the room instead of any air coming in. So when you have clean air being pumped into these rooms, okay, and this air will prevent any microorganisms entering into the room because the air is being pumped out of this room, into the room and out of this room. For example, operation theaters, they maintain positive air pressure. Negative air pressure rooms. So these are used to prevent cross contaminations from room to another room. The ventilation system that flows that allows air to flow into the isolation room but does not allow the air to escape from the isolation room. That means any contaminated air is trapped inside the room and it is filtered through the HEPA filters. So air that comes into the room okay, may be uh, clean or may be contaminated and patients who are isolated in the room, they may have tuberculosis, measles or chicken pox that can be transmitted through droplets or droplet nuclei, right? So this air cannot be allowed to leave the room. So this air has to be sucked up into the ventilation system, which may have a HEPA filter to filter the air. So isolation rooms, or in the case of airborne precautions, patients who are placed in isolation rooms, 
these rooms maintain negative air pressure. We have come to the end of the lecture. We have discussed the transmission based precaution, isolation techniques. Okay, how do you uh, isolate patients who require contact, droplet, or airborne precaution? We also talked about two types of isolation source isolation and protective isolation. And we also looked at the principles of transmission based precautions. We also briefly discussed concurrent and terminal disinfection. Thank you. See you next week for another lecture.